Yeah, hello, good evening, and welcome at New Store here in Berlin. Um, who, who has been here before to any of our talks? Well, that's about half, maybe not quite. So welcome again to those who have been here before, and welcome to all the newcomers. Um, at New Store, we, pr we build applications and services that enable retailers to provide a mobile shopping experience to their customers, as you would expect it these days. Um, always on, you can shop anywhere at any time with single touch simplicity. And at New Store, we have three core values. That's integrity, that's shared success, and innovation. At least two of those you find in talks like this, innovation and shared success. And with that, I want to lead over to Sao, who is with PayPal, a very successful man. And he will talk about one of the programming languages and what you can do with them that we use to build our backend, and that is Go. Have fun with Sao. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so I flew like, I don't know, 8,000 miles here. So it's the first time I'm here in, in Germany, first time in Berlin. And uh, so thanks for your applause and thanks for the tweets. I know some of you probably like looking up for the goodie bag, but uh, I appreciate it as well because I suddenly see like, wow, there are a lot of people tweeting about this. Um, so this is a picture of a place in Singapore very close to my office. I always like to show this because it's very bright, it's very colorful, and it's a very good introduction to Singapore. Um, how many of you have been to Singapore or are from Singapore? Are from Singapore? One person? Okay. I will talk to you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so I think a lot of you have been to Singapore. I actually spoke in an event once where um, there was a live translation from Russian to English and vice versa. And I talk about Singapore, it's like, no, I have no idea where this is. But uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you, you know where Singapore is. Um, I work for a company called PayPal. Um, PayPal's international headquarters is in Singapore, and uh, PayPal does e-payments, which coincidentally I think is very much linked to New Store, but it's just coincidental because, you know, what I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with PayPal, neither does it have anything to do with New Store. So, anyway. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been doing, um, I've been in the industry about 21 years now. It's, it's been quite a while. Uh, I've done a, quite a bit of Java in the beginning. Uh, then I got tired of it and I moved on to, to Ruby and, uh, and I actually wrote a few books on Ruby. Um, so the last one is the one I'm, I'm most proud of because it's been translated into multiple languages. Then I saw Go, right? I picked up Go about uh, a few years ago. I looked at it and I didn't actually like it at a point in time because I couldn't actually do anything with it. It's like interesting language, I think, but I don't know what to do with it. Then I looked at it again a few years later and I saw a very different language. I thought, wow, this is something useful now. I could actually do something with it. So I played around with it and uh, after a while I really liked it. I liked it so much that I actually wrote another book on it. <laughs> so. Um, Go Web Programming is not out yet, and I'm not trying to push you a book here. Like, uh, I'm just saying that uh, I like it so much that I actually, because I, I spent like 20 years doing web programming, right? So I actually wrote a book on Go using web programming, so you can guess um, how good it is. So, but it's nothing to do with web programming, what I'm doing today, uh, or, or rather, sort of, it is a little bit of uh, that. But I'll show you what I'm actually going to do later on. I'm going to show you some code as well. I'm going to do a live demo as well, right? Um, so just hang on for a while. What I'm going to talk about today is complexity. Um, complexity is a very interesting topic. Um, it's actually not a very complex topic. Essentially, it's about a behavior that emerges from a group of interacting parts. Uh, and these parts are not directly the result of, inter of the uh, individual parts themselves. So individually they behave in a certain way, but when they're brought together, it actually behaves in a way that you wouldn't expect it to behave. 
Like so, um, one example I would show is, is starlings. Uh, so I think this is a group of starlings that is like filmed in, in Denmark or something. I don't know. I took it off the internet. Uh, I don't actually see this in Singapore because Singapore obviously don't have starlings, but we have a creature that's very much like that. It's called a, a bina, uh, and they do flock very similarly, although they're not in such large groups. Because it's really fascinating to me. Um, the other one I will give an example is, is uh, schooling fish. So obviously fishes on its own, nothing special, but uh, once you see a school of fish and how it behaves, it's almost like an, a new creature of its own, right? Um, and you see in this picture, uh, again stolen from the internet, <laughs> probably I shouldn't say steal when I'm live streaming, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, taken from the internet, a um, school of fish that's moving very rapidly and uh, behaving completely different from how a, a single fish would behave. So essentially, that's what complexity is about. Um, different parts of things that behave in a certain way as an individual, but when they come together, it behaves completely differently. Right? So um, having introduced complexity to its, its base form, let me just jump straight into one of the things that I want to talk about. So what I always like to do is I like to take certain uh, topics and I look at it in a slightly different way and I try to, to bring out its essence and model it and that's what I'm doing now. Um, I wanted to model um, cultural interactions. I actually had dinner with a friend last night and he was telling me Berlin has like um, 3.5 million people in the, in the metropolis uh, or right in the city and then um, like half a million are actually not from Germany itself. That was quite fascinating because that's very much similar to Singapore. In fact, Singapore has a, a lot more, but nonetheless, it's very similar. And I think how cultures interact with each other is probably important uh, in Berlin as well as in many parts of the world as uh, different cultures come together. We want to talk about how they interact with each other and uh, what happens from that. So just show you a quick funny picture. Laughter, yes, no? no. I think I need to take out this slide because it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> okay. um, anyway, when I talk about cultures interacting with each other, um, one example I like to use is uh, Mickey and Minnie in Japan. Right? Have, have anyone ever been to Disneyland? Quite a few. Have anyone ever been to Disneyland in Japan? No? You hear Mickey and Minnie speaking in Japanese. You hear Donald Duck speaking in Japanese. It's like, is that even possible, Donald Duck speaking Japanese? <laughs> but it is, right? So it's an intermixture of cultures, and it's actually very different. Uh, Starbucks, this is in the Forbidden City. Uh, Chinese food in America is not Chinese food. Right? Um, uh, yoga, as it's practiced today, it's, again, something very different. Um, and, of course, this monstrosity, uh, supposedly called a pizza. I have no idea what it is now. But nonetheless, it's an illustration of of cultures that actually come together, interact with each other, and totally behave or turn into something very different. So this is what I'm trying to model. Um, and of course, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an economist, I'm not uh, anyone who have any specialization in that field. So I turn to something, someone or something that has been done before in the past. Um, Robert Axelrod is a quite a well-known uh, politi political scientist. He's also a complexity theory researcher, and he won some medals before National Medal of Science. Uh, he built a model that's based on two assumptions on how cultures interact with each other. So the first assumption is that cultures that are very similar to each other are more likely to interact. And that sort of makes sense, right? Because if you are next to a culture all the time, then you tend to interact with each other. And when they, count, when they interact, they become more alike each other. Right? So that's, that's the uh, other um, basic axiom that uh, Robert Axelrod based his model on. So with these two, he actually built a model, but what I did is I built a, an agent-based model where each agent represents a culture and then I set up culture as a set of features. Um, of course, each set of feature, each feature is actually like a language, a religion, a style of dress, or you know, uh, whether they like keep their hair long or whatever. Um, 
And of course, a trait is, is a possible values of a, a feature. Like for example, uh, language is a feature. Then like uh, uh, German as a, a language, English as a language, that would be a trait, right? And from there, I build up a 36 by 36 grid where each cell has a culture. And then I set up each culture to have six features. And each feature has 16 possible traits. Now, the question is, why did I choose 6 and 16? Anyone have any idea? It's not a trick question, by the way. Come again, sorry? The sixth combination? 96 combination? Well, that's very sharp, but no, that's not the answer. Um, any others? Well, it's actually a very simple reason. It's, it's actually I'm lazy, really. It's actually this, <laughs> right? Um, anyone know what I'm talking about now? Right, so basically six and 16, right? Um, so 16 is a hex number and uh, six because, you know, that's the number of uh, uh, numbers that digits that you need for a, a color. So I represented a culture in a color. Right? That's essentially what I did. Um, and then from there, I set up each culture to have six neighbors, or sorry, six, eight neighbors, and this is how they will interact with each other. And I create an algorithm. So at every tick, every iteration, I randomly tick n number of cells, and I compare um, the cell with the features of the culture with these neighbors. Right? So I tick the culture and I compare with eight of the neighbors. If the trait difference for the feature is less than uh, t, which, a, which is a, a number that you would define, then I randomly select either culture and copy the trait of one to the other. Just let me illustrate this in, in a graphic more clearly. So A and B are neighboring cultures, and A has a particular set of numbers, B has a particular set of numbers, so I compare each feature and I find a difference. So the difference is, is really a, an absolute difference, right? So you won't get negative numbers. Somebody actually asked me this one. Uh, so it's an absolute number. And then you add them up all together, and you get a difference. You get a difference between the cultures to be a number, right? So if you will look at, carefully at it. Um, if you have the number to be 96, that means you are completely different. It's like black and white, so completely different. And if its difference is zero, it is exactly the same. So these two cultures are exactly the same, right? So that's the two extremes. Um, the again, as I, I mentioned earlier, on the model, the algorithm of the model is that uh, the more similar the two cultures are, the more likely there will be cultural exchange. So the probability that is a cultural exchange is mi one minus the difference between two cultures divided by 96. So the example I gave earlier on. 34, so it has 64.6% of an actual cultural exchange, right? So and when that cultural exchange do happen, when yes, the cultural exchange happens, um, what I do is I copy randomly, just pick one or the other, and copy it from one to the other, therefore making both of them same, therefore making both of them more alike each other. Is that, is that good so far? So what do we want to measure? So we, we iterate through this, we run through a simulation, we run through a model. What do we want to actually measure? So you want to measure one thing. The average feature distance tells us how, of, of, uh, of, uh, how far apart the different cultures are at each iteration, right? and what happens at the end. I mean, there is actually isn't an, at the end uh, sometimes, but when there's an end, how far are the distance from uh, one culture to the other? The other one is unique, number of unique cultures at any given point in time, right? Um, we might start off with um, 1,000 cultures. This is just a random number. But at the end of the day, how many cultures are still remaining? How many cultures have been subsumed into another culture, right? And changes is how vibrant the cultural exchanges are. Right? You could have uh, uh, a lot of changes, but at the same time, if everything still remains the same, uh, it just tells you the vibrancy of how, 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 vib uh, how much changes actually happens. So let me quickly get into the live demo. Uh, 
Oh, by the way, this is, this is the code. Oh, I should use the mouse. Uh, since I asked for the mouse. So this is, this is the code. Very simple Go code. It's on GitHub, so you take your time to read it. Don't need to read it here. Uh, and I'm not really going to talk about the, the code anyway. Um, let me just, just move this aside, and I'll show you the model. Right? So random assignment. Um, randomly assign each one of these a particular color, a particular number. Right? So uh, all random. I can set it up again. Again, it's random. And let me just give it a start. So this is a simulation happening now. This is live, right? Um, basically, you see some cultures actually being subsumed uh, by others. And I have a chart here, right? The chart here shows the three, uh, the three things that we want to measure. The first is the uh, uh, distance. Second is the uniques. And third are the number of changes. You will see that the number of changes remains roughly the same which means it's actually changing all the time. Right? So there's a lot of changes uh, happening. Over time, though, it, it drops. Actually, there's not as many changes. But you will see as well that uh, over time, um, the distance between cultures reduce. And you will see, initially, the distance drops very dramatically. And then after that, it sort of tapers off. But at the same time, the number of unique cultures reduces. Right? So these are some of the, uh, the things that uh, uh, happens. And if you look back at the actual simulation, um, you see the colors starting to form, right? You see like patches of green, red, uh, light blue, and so on, and they become more and more similar to each other. And uh, let me just get back to the slides. Oops. So this, this is the demo. And uh, eventually, it actually comes down to this. So let's look at some of the observations. E eventually, you do re achieve some kind of equilibrium, and there are only a few dominant cultures. And the dominant cultures can be very radically different from one another, which means the, the colors are actually very far apart from each other. And that's, that's to be expected. Right? Um, if I reduce the grid size, instead of 36 by 36, maybe I put like 24, 24 12 by, 2 by 12, it results in faster equilibrium. That means it will achieve equilibrium a lot faster. And there's also a smaller number of dominant cultures. Yeah, that's also expected. Um, but what is probably not expected is, say, a culture that is more dominant at one point in time doesn't mean it will be dominant to, towards the end. And it doesn't mean also that one culture as it is today, it won't remain whatever it is to like the, the end of time, right? The cultures actually do shift. Cultures actually do merge, and they actually uh, evolve over time. So this is the modeling that I've done for this particular uh, um, example, uh, one particular complex system that have been, been modeled. So. Um, the second one that I'm looking at is racial segregation. This is not controversial for people, right? No? Okay. Because I got a French friend who told me, it's like, after I gave this talk, he was very stony faced and said, like, you can't talk about this in Europe. I was like, why? You know, because it's very sensitive. And say, like, okay. And here I am talking to you guys. So, anyway, let's hope nothing happens. <laughs> um, in 2000, a cartographer, a person who, who creates maps uh, called Bill Rankin, what he did was he took a map of Chicago and then uh, basically mapped for every, I can't remember the actual number now. Can you see? Uh, each dot represents 25 person, 25 people. So he actually, what he did was he created a, a map of different races within the city, Chicago, right? Uh, very colorful map, but I think what is very obvious to everyone is like, yeah, there is a lot of segregation between races. The, the, uh, 
Uh, oranges are very are, are stuck in one corner. The blues are in another area. Um, the 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 pinks are another part of uh, the city. They are all very clear boundaries of where certain races actually live. Right. So the question is: Is Chicago unique? Is that characteristic of Chicago? Is anyone from Chicago here, by the way? No. Okay. But it doesn't really matter anyway. So <laughs> actually, there were a lot more other cities that were were chartered, and uh, so Chicago is not unique, right? So L.A., Washington D.C., Detroit, New York City, uh, more and more of such charts were were made, and then I think the the realization is, yeah, there are segregation of races. I mean, people with certain ethnicity do tend to group among each other, and it is actually not a good thing. But is it an American thing? Is that is that something wrong with Americans? Um, apparently no, because again, somebody did this thing for, for London. Uh, there is also strong segregation of different races within like one of the most multicultural um, cities in the world, right? So there it is. Is this a, a natural phenomenon? Is it to be expected? Can anything be done to change it? And what can be done to change it? So again, this is a complex system. Um, as an individual, we choose to live where we choose to live due to many different factors. And race is probably only one of the factors. But yet, if you look at it in the overall, you do see that there is clear segregation. So obviously, race may or may not take a very important part of it. Is that, is that uh, the conclusion? So this is what I'm trying to model. And I, I built a model out of this. Uh, from, again, not my own research, but from research from a researcher called Thomas Schelling. He's a famous economist. In fact, he not won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2005. And what he did was he wrote a paper. It's called um, uh, Dynamic Models of Segregation in 1971. Right? He, he wrote the paper before I was born. Right? Um, what he did was and there was no computer simulation at that point in time. What he did was he laid out a grid of 12 to 12, and he put coins in it, and it did about the same thing as I'm, I'm going to do in a computer simulation. So again, I use the 36 by 36 grid. Um, each cell is, represents a household. Eight neighbors, you very well know now. Um, the algorithm, again, uh, everything I check, every cell, is a little bit different from the previous algorithm where I just pick n number of cells. And if there is at least n number of neighbors that are of the same race, then I don't do anything. So N basically is a threshold, right? I'm comfortable living in this neighborhood with uh, the makeup with the same ethnicity as I am. Otherwise, I would move to a different place, provided there is a different place for me to move, right? If there's an empty cell, I will move to that empty cell. Right, so let's pick some parameters. So N, obviously, the number of acceptable neighbors is something that we want to, to play around with. Um, are the number of races in the grid, percentage of vacant cells, because there's no, there are no vacancies, you can't move at all. But does it mean that if I have more space, do I, do I encourage more people to segregate? If I reduce the amount of space, would there be less segregation? Um, and also, of course, policy, right? Um, as you can implement certain policies to say, if uh, within this area, you cannot have like uh, a very clearly a large majority of a particular ethnicity. So that could be policy as well. So uh, using that as a basis of the model, again, this is some code. I will get into. Um, so yeah, this is the, this is actually what happens just now. Right. Anyway, let's look at this now. Uh, okay, this looks a little bit better. Right. So again, random. Number of neighbor, acceptable number of neighbors, two. Number of races, again, two. We can see the cells, 20%. Um, neighbor quota, eight. So let's start. So using the same algorithm, at every tick, I would say, am I comfortable sitting where I am? Am I comfortable um, basically where I am? If the answer is yes, then I don't move. If the answer is no, then I move. Yes, sorry, I have a question. Can you only jump to a vacant cell close to where you are? Anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. 
Anywhere there's a vacant cell. So you realize that uh, very quickly the simulation ends and there is segregation. Right? So the thing is, uh, acceptable number of neighbors two is actually pretty small. It's actually pretty small. Uh, let me increase that to three and set it up and see what happens. There is basically more obvious segregation. So you realize that um, there comes a point in time where you are constantly unhappy because you can never meet the quota. And what happens? Right, of course, this is, this is not rich yet. So there will be a segment of the population who are generally stable, and they are really segregated. And then the population is like, they are forever unhappy, and they are forever moving. Right? So there's instability. Because in real life, this is probably never going to happen. But again, it sort of demonstrates the way that segregation actually naturally happens. Uh, let's, let's, let's change this. And the code again is, is available on GitHub. You can download it, you can change some of the code, you can change the parameters, you can add different parameters. Uh, go crazy and do stuff with it. Let me get back to the slides. And, uh, so yeah, you can do different um, number of races as well, and then you will see clear segregation. So observations. Segregation happens even if there's a weak preference or neighbors of the same type. So I chose two, right? Uh, which means I'm happy if they are just, out of my eight neighbors, two are the same ethnicity for, for me, uh, same ethnicity as I am. But I, you can still see a lot of clear segregation. The weaker the preference, the less segregated. Um, of course, you will see that as I increase the number of N, the, the larger N is, the more the bigger the, the clusters are, right? And therefore, after a while, you see like they are really very big clusters. And so if you actually reduce the number of N, then you see smaller clusters, which is good. The stronger preference, the more segregated. At a threshold, the stronger preference results in unstable, but non-segregated state, So because they are always moving. Right? So this is not desirable as well. Number of races have no impact on segregation. So you have like five. You can try this on your own, you get five. Uh, they will still segregate in five different uh, clusters. Number of vacant cells have, again, no impact on segregation. And what is more uh, unexpected is really like policy enforcement has limited impact. So the stronger the policies are, you will just render it to be an unstable state. Right? So what's the conclusion here? It's like the um, human race doom because, you know, we are always racially segregated from each other. I think not. I think uh, if you look at the number two, right, if you can reduce it to one, actually the clusters become very less apparent. So I think that there, there is still hope. Um, but again, I think the model here is not real life. I think what is important to realize is what I'm modeling here is not real life. Uh, um, is, it is a model. Sorry, you have a question. Yep. 20 years ago, yep. and, and, and uh, giving 
case, so you have a two-dimensional problem. The number of control parameters, so you have a six-dimensional control parameter. And then you can, and then the third thing, which is controlling the entire thing, is the temperature. So in the very simple model, the icing model, you can have this domain thing until you reach the cooling temperature, then everything breaks into pieces. So it's not a domain. But this is weak science. So I, right, so I don't claim to actually own any one of these things, right? Because as I mentioned, so a couple of things. Whether there's Nobel Prize in economics, I do not know. This is what I read of his profile, and that's why I put it in there. Secondly, the paper that he wrote in 71 about segregation, I'm not sure whether that's the one he won the Nobel Prize for. I don't think that's the one he won. I'm not sure. So whatever I'm writing here is really not about him winning any Nobel Prize. So we could have this discussion after this. If I could just continue. So I actually have a third particular model which I use, which is actually a little bit different from the first two I used. So the bystander effect. This girl is called Kitty Genovese. She was born in New York. And in 1964, she was murdered. At that point in time, she was 19, and she was just graduated from high school. And basically, somebody stalked her and killed her. And it was in front of a large number of people, apparently. And therefore, the news headline said, like, 37 saw the murder, didn't actually call the police. So what is happening to the human race, right? So why are we so cold-blooded and not bothering about other people at all? So that's the bystander effect. I think this is actually quite a well-researched problem. Again, I'm not introducing any new science here. It's something that is actually quite well-known. So another phenomenon that is well-known as well is about this meerkat. So meerkat is an animal that lives in, I think, in Africa. And whenever they go foraging for food, it's actually quite a dangerous activity. So we'll be very careful of predators who would actually prey on them. So one or more meerkats actually do this thing, right? They will just stand up as tall as they can and just look around. It's like any predators. If they're predators or they sense danger, they will shout and warn the rest. So obviously, the meerkat who shouts or makes a sound obviously alerts the predator, right? So therein lies the problem. Altruism actually will bring you to death. So that's actually part of the model that I want to... That's part of the problem I want to model. And it's based something on game theory, which is a study of mathematical models of conflict and cooperation. And it's often used in economics and political science. And in this particular model that we're trying to do, it's called the volunteer's dilemma. So volunteer's dilemma comes from, like, if somebody volunteer, would he be disadvantaged, or he or she be disadvantaged because he or she volunteered? So that's, that's the volunteer uh, dilemma. And we're going to model this based on Kitty Genovese's um, case. And here are some of the parameters. V is a value you gain if one person volunteers, and C is uh, individual cost of volunteering. A is overall cost if no one volunteers. Right? Um, let's shrink it down instead of having 37 people. So 37 by 37 matrix. We shrink it down to a payoff matrix or two-player game, right? So two by two. So you have things like uh, on one column, if I volunteer or I don't volunteer, and you volunteer or you don't volunteer. So basically, two people, if they volunteer and I volunteer, then there were certain results. If you volunteer and I don't volunteer, there are certain other results. Right? So in a case where I volunteer, the value is the same. It's V minus C. 
Uh, if I don't volunteer, then it differs whether you volunteer or don't. If you volunteer, then the value that, that comes out is V, otherwise uh, it's V minus A. Because the, the end result that you want to reach is actually what is called the mixed strategy, uh, Nash equilibrium, which basically uses this formula. Um, for n player game, right, uh, we create a probability of volunteering to be P times n minus one, so uh, three, uh, times P n minus one times, so it's P to the power of n minus one. And the probability of not volunteering, so it becomes one minus P to the power of n minus one. To put this, all these formulas together, it becomes a complicated looking formula. So that actually this is not as complicated. You actually derive it, it becomes like with this simple formula. So with this formula now, we can try to do another simulation. Um, basically using Monte Carlo simulation, basically we just take all the parameters and basically run the model over and over again until we find a pattern. Again, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the code. And let me get to the demo. This is the last demo. Let's go to volunteers dilemma. She don't need this anymore. Right. So basically if the volunteer cost is very low, which means the cost of me volunteering is very low then the probability of volunteering becomes high. And that's, that's quite normal, right? So the cost becomes very high. Up to a certain point, it's like there's no point because the cost is for me to volunteering is so high, then probably nobody actually wants to volunteer, right? So let's, if you look at it here, so this is the, uh, the model. And if the overall cost, let's look at the overall cost. If the overall cost is very high, that the higher it gets, of course, everybody or as many people will want to volunteer. Because if I don't volunteer, maybe like uh, tomorrow is the end of the world. Like, of course, I would want to volunteer. Right? But of course, if the overall cost is very low, if it's actually very trivial, then you will, you will realize that the uh, probability of volunteering is actually very low as well. And last piece of simulation, looking carefully at here, Number of agents. Number of agents meaning number of people actually participating in the experiment. If you reduce the number of people and increase the number of people, what happens? Nothing much happens. So really, even if there are two people in the Kitty Genovese's case, or there are 37 people or 370 people, really, it's, there's not much difference. It's not about the number of people. Right? It is. A lot of it has to do with these two. What is the cost of volunteering, overall cost of volunteering, and what is the individual cost of volunteering? Now let's get back to the slides. Let's take a look at this. This is a demo. Observations. So um, how do you want this tragedy not to happen again. You just decrease the individual cost of volunteering, right? So it makes it easier for people to volunteer, makes people to say, make, call the police or whatever it is. Increase the overall cost, the impact of not volunteering. Uh, meaning like, if something bad happens, every, everybody will penalize $1 million, right? Now of course, everyone has incentive to volunteer. Of course, that is not good because you know, that's probably never enforceable. Uh, so overall cost is probably not a very good uh, factor to change. Increase the difference between individual cost and overall cost. Right? So this is something I didn't show early on. Let me just quickly just show it again. So you will look here around this number here. If I, in if I do this, and I do this, you notice the chart is still the same, right? Or roughly it's still the same. Why? It's so the 
the important thing to notice is actually the difference between the, the volunteer cost and overall cost. It's not specifically just either one or the other. So there in comes the, uh, the observation. Um, it's actually the difference between the individual cost and the overall cost. And of course, reduce the number of players. Does it really work? No, actually, it doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, increasing number of players have negative or no impact at all. Yeah. So that's, that's the model. Again, I, I just want to say that uh, these are all models. Right? And again, these are not models of something new that I've created. The, uh, uh, the reason why I could show you all these things pretty simply, pretty quickly, within a short demo, uh, is because these are actually established research done by researchers um, a long time ago. Right? So the papers have already been written. Um, I'm taking out these papers, I'm looking at them in a slightly different way, and I try to model it using uh, computer simulations, uh, which at that point in time, a lot of the researchers do not have that facility to do it. So to just talk a little bit about the simulations itself, the back end is written in Go. Um, it emits JSON. The front end is a web application, as you can see. Uh, but if it's a web application with a, a slight twist, the 36 by 36 grid is actually using uh, Bootstrap. Right? So Bootstrap, and this change the color in each of the, the cells. Right? And then you get the 36 by 36 cells. Uh, I know Bootstrap normally is not 36 by 36, but you can actually change uh, a parameter and you will generate a, a particular CSS to make it 36 by 36, or any number actually, 48 or whatever it is that you want. Right? So that, that's the model. Uh, that's the uh, three models I, I wanted to, to show you guys today. And uh, one last word I want to leave you with. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of research done in different domains, in different ideas. And I think intermarrying of uh, different domains and people uh, reading up papers from different industries, different domains is actually pretty useful. It can actually help you learn new things. Not that these things have not been discovered, but yourself, you, you will be enriched uh, by learning some of these things. With that, uh, I'll end my talk today. Thank you. So, you, can find the, uh, you can find the code at github.com. It's under complexity simulations. Yes. Uh, Hi. Um, thanks a lot for the talk. I wanted to ask a question about the tools that you were using, but before that I wanted to say in regards to the comment beforehand that, that the simulation you did is much more close is much closer if you want to a POTS model and for that you don't have a general solution, especially in two dimensions. So for higher clusters. So the easy model is a really, really bad example for this and I think especially since you can show that the clusters are unstable, I'll be really, really careful to just say everything is solved. Anyway. Um, the, about Go, I, I was wondering why you chose Go in particular because I mean I'm doing simulations myself on a bit different topic and uh, I uh, needed to choose like a systems language basically which Go right. isn't but I needed performance right. and so I went for Rust because I couldn't bear the pain of C++ and I wonder if you have a similar reason for that. So um, I used to be a Rubyist, or I, I am still a Rubyist, and I actually develop a lot of systems in, in Ruby. Um, I did Ruby for like 11 years, and I'm still doing Ruby today. Um, so I used to do simulations using Ruby, and it's still doable. I think some of these are still very much, much doable. Um, but the simplicity of doing it with just one file, it's, it's actually quite um, overwhelming uh, simplicity. And of course, the performance in terms of um, I could actually write everything. Uh, I mean, performance is, is pretty good in the sense that you, you notice the front end actually um, uses React. Uh, I didn't mention that earlier on. But yeah, the front end uses React. Um, and it actually takes a lot of data from the back end really rapidly. But yet, uh, the, the back end could follow uh, through um, very, rap very quickly as well. So I think that's something that's pretty amazing. Uh, for me, at least, I'm, I've not tried Rust, so so I I have no idea. How did your couple go and uh, go and 
React? Did you, I mean, are you just dumping everything to a file or do you actually have some serialization like network messaging? Like thinking no. of zero MQ or something like this? No network messaging. So Go is, a, is basically a web service that emits JSON and then the uh, client is a, I'll show you the client actually, it's easier to talk about it that way. Uh, use the mouse. It is. So this is this is just the back end. Um, so it's I can't remember what the question was, but uh, anyway, it's, it's actually not very it's not very complex either. No. Sorry, I can't remember the question. Oh, if I look at it. I, I was wondering again. So go emit something. I mean, I'm. I have never worked with it, so I have no idea about this. So I, I'm just wondering, I mean, is, is Go creating the, the, the website and then React is just displaying it on the fly? Oh, or? so Go is emitting JSON. So it's actually doing the, the simulations and at every, iter every iteration it actually emits the, the data. And it emits the data whether somebody actually captures it or not. So React basically captures the data and displays it. And if React is too slow, basically it doesn't display whatever comes out is em being emitted. Yeah, but uh, so Go basically emits, just keeps on emitting. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I think the programming language is the least important thing on that. And what you showed, but not explicitly followed up with is there is a phase transition in every of these interesting models where, where you have a phase transition uh, where cooperation wins and where competition wins. So it, this is the important thing that, that you, if, if you want to make a social conclusion, you should find a way to structure a social society that cooperation wins and not confrontation. Right. So I, I'm actually not making any conclusions here at all. Right, so no conclusions. It is that all observations. The, the ob my observations on the results that come out from the system. So there's there's really no conclusion. I, I make no particular conclusion that one way or the other. Uh, can I ask more engineering related question? Sure. How you notify your client that server emitted new portion of data? You open socket or you just constantly uh, like ask server from your React application? Yeah, so React basically picks up the data from, from the Go server. So the Go server continually emits JSON. It doesn't, it doesn't stop. It just continually emits JSON. Um, whether there is a client that would pick it up or not, it will just continually emit JSON. Um, and, and React basically React will collect it, the data. somebody else a question? So, I guess that's it. Either project. Uh, let me just show this again. So I, I, can I show this, this one? So this is actually my, my main GitHub. It's just slash complexity simulations. In fact, you can't miss it because that's the only one that's like, uh, that says complexity. So I'm going to stick around for a while. I've, oh yeah, there's another question actually. Thanks for the talk. Um, I got one question. Um, I'm not coding in, in Go, so I have no idea about, about that. Um, I've seen the code. Um, how does this work then? Do I have to compile it? Is there like a virtual machine running the code? How is that working in general? I have no idea about that. Just, just let me show you the, uh, again, come back to here. Uh, I will, don't worry, I'll move it down. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So this, this is all the code there is. Um, basically, you just go build, and it will compile the application, and then you get a binary, and I run the binary. So I, I basically run the binary complexity simulations, and that will start up the server. And uh, this is the... It's the main file. 
where I will go to volunteer slash show to view that particular uh, simulation. Okay, so it actually bundles mm. uh, a Go binary which runs this Go code, or is it just yes. x86 code, or what does it compile to? Do you know that? Uh, it's executable code. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Does, by the way, does anyone do Go here? It's, uh, <laughs> so a lot more people can actually answer the questions. Yeah. I just have one quick question. Why did you choose sure. React? Did you try any other front-end technologies, or is there any particular reason why you used React? Um, so actually, I just wanted to do the simulation. And I was learning React at a point in time, so I just used React. Okay. You know? there's, there's no particular reason why I use React. In fact, there's no particular reason to say that it can only be done in Go either. Uh, you can actually use any other programming language. And like saying truly about technology stack, I see there is React and jQuery probably, right? There is jQuery also. There is jQuery as well. Yeah. Oh, OK. I mean, I, I, it's not the only thing I use, right? So I use a few things uh, combined. Like um, for the charts, I actually use like a Google chart to, to chart out that, okay, that guy. Yes. I, I, I don't quite get it. Yeah. Oh, we can we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about. Uh, you said you are using some kind of multi agent architecture, that's the reason why you're using Go? So, I mean, this, this is a pretty good question. You, you, you got me there, actually, because originally that was my intention. And it's because of the channels or? Yeah, so that was, that was my original intention, because I did a simulation previously in another simulation with another topic altogether uh, using Ruby, and it hit a hard limit in terms of uh, number, amount of memory use and so, so on. And I was trying to do the same thing in Go, um, I was going to use like uh, concurrency and everything else, and then once I actually ran it, I realized that I it ran so fast I don't really need it anymore. So I I just didn't need it anymore. So I was like, okay, never mind. I I don't need it anymore. Yeah. So that was the one of the intentions getting into the simulation, but because it ran so quickly, I didn't need to to actually use it after all. Yes. Um, I have a question. Maybe you can explain or describe something about uh, is PayPal use Go and where and how wide? So um, PayPal doesn't use Go officially today. It does not use Go officially today. Um, but there was a project that uses Go that used to use Go. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys have heard of uh, Beacon a uh, long time ago. But yeah, there was uh, Go. In, in fact, there was an open source uh, set of code that was released in Go uh, from PayPal. But uh, we, we don't use Beacon anymore. Um, so that project is no longer alive. Yeah. Why? I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> you know. It's not that um, anything is that I don't know the answer, therefore I cannot answer you. <laughs> Yeah. I have also a question. Uh, here in this solution, you completely decoupled backend and frontend. Yes. And actually, you are a Ruby developer, and probably you know Rails. Are there some kind of solution like Rails in Go, and why haven't you chosen it if there are any? Yeah, so there are um, frameworks in Go. But uh, again, it's the same thing as like using channels and things like that, right? So Go actually has such a rich. Um, standard library, I don't really need another framework on top of it. So that's why I don't use it at all. Yeah. Okay. But there are frameworks that have been created, but uh, I tried them, some of them. Some of them are pretty cool, but unnecessary. You, you, know? it's, it just don't, it's, you don't really need it. It's kind of cool to play around with it, but it's not really needed. So whereas my first few original web applications that I wrote in Go actually uses things like, um, What's that? I can't remember what's that now. One very popular one. Uh, Martini, yes. Uh, I use Martini. Um, there was another one that's called Beagle. Um, 
It was actually pretty powerful as well. But I look at a few of them, it's like, it's not really necessary, you know, but, so why would I want to use that anymore? It's like, okay, never mind, I'll just drop the use of it. I'll stick to standard library altogether. So, I think this is it for tonight. Thank you, Sao Shang.